Um, so now, um, for the main course, uh, so that's the stack, right? Um, we have Mike Doyle. Um, Mike is a licensed US lawyer and senior partner at uh, Seri Manop and Doyle based here in Bangkok. He's actually been practicing here since uh, 1996. Speaks and writes, reads Thai fluently. Um, he's wrote, um, the, the author of this book here, um, Practical Guide to Thailand Business Law, okay, um, which is he's donating this to the Sassan Library. Thank you, man. Um, so this, this is the fourth edition already. And um, it's been published by Carolina Academic Press in the US and sells all over Asia. Okay, so his core, uh, core expertise are commercial transactions, merger acquisition, and energy projects. Um, so Mike also published over 70 articles um, in newspapers and magazines and trade journals. Um, mostly on foreign investment in Southeast Asia. Um, so without further ado, um, I'd like to welcome Mike to the floor and then we can start with the talk. Thanks, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, many years ago, uh, one of my friends and a, and a client of mine uh, named Kevin Bolet gave me some interesting advice that, that maybe some of our younger participants here might find useful. Uh, if, if you don't know, Kevin is the former president of uh, Marriott Thailand, and, uh, and then he was recruited by Bill Heineke to be his number two person at the minor group. And after that, after he left Minor, he went on to establish, to become an entrepreneur, he, he established his own hotel management uh, business called Envision. Uh, and, and that's when I started working with him, and it's been uh, very successful. Now, Kevin told me that he, he categorizes all successful business people that he meets into one of three groups. Okay? Either they're a leader, or an entrepreneur, or a manager, okay, and none of these are better than the other because the world needs all three, okay, but each of these three groups uh, have their own inherent strengths and weaknesses that we should recognize. You know, we should recognize in others and we should recognize uh, in, our, in ourselves. For, for example, leaders tend to be great, uh, great with, with people, and communicating, and they really understand the need to multiply effort. But leaders aren't normally great foot soldiers in the business. Okay? Maybe their ideas not not as focused on smaller things as, as bigger things. Managers are, tend to be uh, very good at, at dealing with information and details, but but less good uh, dealing with people. You know, think, think of the accountant you know, in that situation. Entrepreneurs, uh, typically uh, passionate idea people and risk takers, but sometimes overly optimistic and uh, may not be great uh, with details. Now, what Kevin was uh, trying to teach me so long ago was I needed to understand my own strengths and weaknesses so as I develop, just like this, you guys develop, I can surround myself with people to emphasize my strengths and to help compensate, compensate for my weaknesses. And one of the areas when I work with entrepreneurs, and uh, I, I really like to, to work with startups and, and entrepreneurs, uh, one area where I see them struggle, especially early in their career, is dealing with legal matters. I mean, maybe everybody hates lawyers, but entrepreneurs really, really uh, hate lawyers because they don't find the deal they don't typically find the details of uh, uh, legal legal things interesting, and they don't they don't see that lawyers bring enough value added for the uh, expense that they cause. 
which, which I understand. So that causes uh, entrepreneurs to not focus on legal issues enough, you know, until it's too late, and then they've got no choice to talk about what they mean or, or someone like me. So what I'm going to do uh, today is to go through uh, three very, very real life situations where I see startups screw up. Okay, uh, the first, and it, these are very simple. You know, I don't have to get complicated to show where uh, where where entrepreneurs take a wrong turn in, in terms of uh, legal matters. These are very straightforward. You'll see you'll see the issues very clearly, uh, and then you can ask whatever whatever questions you like. The first common mistake has to do with company capitalization. All right. Uh, the next uh, deals with leasing space. You know, believe it or not. And the last mistake concerns the implication of not having a shareholder's agreement. Each of these, uh, each of these situations is extremely straightforward, but I can't tell you how many times I've seen and I've charged people for, for these exact same simple, simple issues that, that are uh, avoid. This is an in informal uh, setting, so if you have any questions, feel free to stop me. When I get through, I'm happy to ask answer questions about these areas or anything else uh, you'd like to ask about. Okay, when, when I deal with startups, uh, one common mistake that I that I see is a mentality of what's the minimum amount that I can put at risk and still get this this business off the ground. All right, and I see that a lot, and it makes it is completely understandable. I mean, no one wants to put more money at risk than they absolutely have to. However, I'll tell you that this type of thinking can cause issues down the line, especially if the business becomes very successful. And a prime example of this involves uh, where you set your registry capital. Re registry capital represents the total amount of liability that uh, the shareholders have in have in a particular business. So that means if the registered capital of the business is 10 million baht and all the shareholders collectively put in that 10 million baht, they should have no more, they should have no further liability at all. You know, if somebody sues you, if the, if the revenue department audits the company, they get that, that amount that's fully paid up and that's it, okay? So thinking of it from this standpoint, uh, it makes perfect sense to undercapitalize your company, right? But, but because you want you want to limit the amount of money that you put at risk, and, and that's what uh, and, and that's what people naturally would do. So typically, startups will put in only the, the amount of, of money that they absolutely need, you know, for to uh, to get the work permits that you need, or to to pay staff for the first X uh, months. And then, instead of increasing the capital as the, the businesses, uh, as the businesses' working capital needs increase, they'll just do shareholder loans, which is also completely legal. You know, it's it's completely legal, and and it's also efficient because if you if you finance the company like that, you give yourself an efficient way to take the money out, to take the money back plus interest. You know, whenever whenever you want. But uh, there can be some, some problems with that. Okay, one of my clients uh, was a, a foreign health, a Thailand registered company in the office supply business. The, the two shareholders of the company, uh, 10 years ago, they registered the capital as low as they possibly could right? in order to qualify for the number of workers they needed. Uh, so they, the capital was sent at 10 million bucks. And the, when the company needed uh, when the company needed operating capital, they just gave shareholder loans for an eight percent interest rate. You know, which makes sense. You know, there's nothing illegal about that. So by doing it that way, they were uh, financing the company's operations. Uh, they had a way to take money out when they wanted to, and at the same time, they were increasing, increasing the amount that they're putting at risk. You know, they're putting at risk long term. You know, if, if somehow the, com the company ran into some uh, liability. 
So this went on for 10 years. And during that 10 year time, the company's book value grew to 500 million by. Right. It was a retail business and it just, and it just hit, hit right. And then a large uh, a family health company here approached these guys and wanted to buy them out for the purchase price of 550 million bucks. So that, that's a really good, you know, that's a, that's a really good situation. And for an entrepreneur, you most entrepreneurs will only have a few times in their life to really cash out, you know, cash out of a business. So you want to take full advantage of. It. But uh, they, they incurred, incurred a problem here, and it illustrates a very common mistake that I see entrepreneurs make. Okay? That is, they don't plan for their exit. You know, they fall in love with their business. They don't even think about life after their business. So they don't think about how they can maximize opportunities to, to sell. All right, uh, but in order to, to to really maximize opportunities like this, you have to think about things like taxes, and you have to do some advanced planning. Yeah. Uh, in this example, is the tax the American tax or the tax? Contact tax. Contact tax. All contact tax, but the principles are universal. Just the rates would be different. Now, the, the offer, uh, the offer was was to buy a hundred percent of the shares for five hundred fifty billion baht, which was great. And they were really excited, but the catch was it was only good for two weeks, which is also very, very common. Yeah. Uh, uh, a lot of purchasers won't want, want, the, won't want the process to, to drag out. And so that's when they come to, to see me. And after they explain the situation to me, I congratulate them. And then I told them, you're about to get clobbered, clobbered in, in taxes. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely hit. And why? Because Thailand, uh, just like most countries, attaches a tax to the gain realized by the sale of shares. All right? And the way it works is, if you buy privately held shares and then you later sell, so, so, so say you buy for one and you sell for ten, that nine will be included in your individual tax return in the year that the sale is realized. So that means that that nine is included in all of your rest of your uh, taxable income for that year. And the tough thing here was that the sales price was 550 million baht, but their basis was only 10. Their basis was only 10 because they never increased their register count. They never thought they had a reason to, and they never did any tax payment. So, okay. So that means their net gain, their net cumulative gain was 540 million, and that's taxed at 35 percent, which means they pay 189 million baht to to the to the revenue department. Now, I mean, the, the, this isn't worst case scenario. I mean, the, 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 they made you know they made a lot of money and then they wanted to do other things, but what they didn't do is they didn't maximize the opportunity. I mean, they paid, they paid a hundred million, they, they should have paid some, some tax already, but they paid a hundred million baht in tax too much. I mean, that could have been enough to fund their next business, you know, or to give to their kids when they die, or, you know, whatever. Anything's better than giving it to the government. Okay, and wh why was the basis 10? Because they never changed the ratio of capital. You know, they, 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 they never did, so they left it ridiculously low, irrespective of the company's actual uh, value. And the offer was only, you know, if they would have given me two, two, uh, six months or three months, I can do a lot in three months, okay? But they gave me two weeks. Two weeks, I'm too transparent. You know, I, 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 can't, I can't propose a way to minimize the tax, uh, to minimize the tax in a way that's safe, you know, that, that's, that's not it safe. And the, and the buyer wasn't about to pay offshore, you know, offshore in Hong Kong or Singapore or somewhere. Why? Because if they don't want it to screw up their basis for in the future when they sit, right? If they would have been 50-50 offshore 
and then they sell again for twice as much again, they would get hidden taxes, so they're not, so not going to do it. So these guys uh, still make a lot of money, but they, but they took it on the chin. Wouldn't the offshore payment be legal anyway? Yeah, it would be completely legal. It's strange that you recommend it. No, 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 I, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't recommend it, but, but you'll see. But you'll see in business, well, I, I for sure did not recommend that. Uh, but you'll see that in deals like this, you'll say, oh, you know, I'll, I'll just have it paid off sure that'll be my risk. But forget the law. From a business perspective, a lot of people will do, I mean, a lot of buyers won't do that because why? It puts them at a disadvantage because they're smart enough to think about their future equity. You see, and it depends their basis. They do, if they only pay 200 million in Thailand and you know 340 million, uh, 350 million offshore, 200 million is their basis. You know, for their future sale. Now, okay, now what what could they have done? Yeah, you know, what what if I would what if they would have been paying for this, which they obviously weren't? What what legally could you have done? Now these are all individuals. Okay, so under the Thai tax code, there's nothing that prohibits. A, a shareholder to transfer shares at par value to a company offshore. And there, it's already a foreign company. It's already a foreign company. So if they would have transferred 50% of their shares to Singapore, then the classification of their business wouldn't have changed at all. Now, they couldn't have done more than 50% because uh, Americans have kind of some, some kind of special status here. So, but they could have transferred 49% and cut their tax bill in half. But, but they didn't. And they end up paying the maximum amount of tax that they possibly can. And I'm sure that they'll remember, remember that for the, for the rest of their lives. Before you go away from that, what exactly is involved in increasing the capitalization? I've never been too clear on what capitalization is anyway. So, you know, supposing you, you implied or said that they should have been increasing their capitalization over the years. Is that a declaration? Is that. No, no, so, 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 so all, all, you, all you do when you increase capital is you call a shareholders meeting and a resolution is passed. And that's it. So you increase the capital. That doesn't mean the money has to stay in the company. You know, you can still pay out dividends over time as long as you call a lot. So the, another way that they could have uh, uh, reduced their, their, their tax burden is by increasing their capital over time. You know, instead of putting in shareholder loans, which doesn't affect their their registered capital at all. They just increase their capital, but they take out more. They take out more dividends. Uh, question. Yeah. So related to that, so is that the same as when you're operating a company and you have earnings, and then you can retain earnings, and that adds to your? To your yeah, sales? I mean, yeah, it's, re re retained earnings are on your balance sheet. You know, but normally in a deal like this, you have retained earnings. People, uh, they. Uh, Buyers and sellers won't want to pay cash for cash, you know, cash for cash. So they'll say, issue dividends, get that money out, because we don't want to pay for the cash. You know, so the retained earnings could have been converted into the rights issue to increase the capital. Yes, sir. Good. Good. But, but the could have been converted into a rights issue, but once, but once uh, <coughs> dividends are, you, you can't contract to say uh, future dividends. We agree to put back into the into the company. I mean, that, that, that's not legally enforceable. But there's only two of them, you know, they, and they they don't want to pay. You know, they want to reduce their tax, their collective tax burden. So uh, you know, there's things that they could have done. Okay. The, the next thing I'm going to just talk about is really very practical, unsophisticated. But it happens all the time, and it's it's simple, you know. It, it's a simple rule that people just overlook or don't care about. I, I don't know. But a mistake that I see all the time involves leases. So you're saying, "Hey, I'm, I'm not in the real estate business. Why the hell are you talking about leases?" Uh, I'm like, but the reason is that I couldn't tell you how many startups uh, make this mistake. You know, so if you don't remember anything else today, remember you remember this rule. Leases for longer than three years are not enforceable unless they're registered on the land title. Okay. Leases for over three years are not enforceable unless they're on the land title. 
This is for over three. Uh, now, now, if, 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 and if they're not, if they're not registered on the land title, three years in one day, you might as well tear up, tear up the contract. It's not, it's not enforceable uh, at all. But when you start up a business, you got to be located somewhere. You know, so you'll either have to buy space or you'll lease space, and, and uh, most startups will start out uh, a leasing space. One of my clients was a, a German uh, startup in the home decoration business, and he leased a building on Ekamai and used it as his office and showroom and invested about 25 million baht to, to fit it out. The rent there was uh, 250,000 baht a, a month, uh, payable yearly in advance, and the term of the lease was 22 years. Okay. Now, what, they executed the lease agreement, but they didn't register it. All right, and, uh, and it caused major problems. In year seven, the landowner died. Okay, they died. and uh, the landowner who was a party to the to the lease, and then the land was inherited by his children. And very soon after that happened, uh, the company, the German company, received a letter from the former uh, owner's kids ordering the company to vacate the building within 30 days. So this is when they called my office and they say, what are you talking about? You know, I have, I have a valid uh, lease agreement that was, uh, that was witnessed and everything. It's, it's completely enforceable. Uh, but it's, they said it was a but but it, but it wasn't. So they ended up having to. Uh, they, they said, "Hey, I've got 13 more years. 13 more years left on, on this lease." But then I had to tell them. I said, you know, "Leases for longer than three years have to be registered on the land title." Okay, well, why wasn't this? Re why aren't leases registered on the land title? It's tax. Yeah. You do that when you register the lease on the land title. The, uh, that's a clear record that the owner of the of the premises owes 12.5 percent tax on the amount of rent I received. So that's why owners don't like to do that. But you know, which, which, which is their which is their uh, rocket. But as a tenant, especially if you're investing almost a million dollars in fitting out the place uh, to use over the long term, you need to know that. You're only guaranteed uh, that that space for, for only for only three years. So this was a bad result. You know? And the the guy that they originally entered into the lease agreement, he, he didn't have any he didn't have any uh, intention to cheat him, you know. Uh, but his kids, I mean, maybe maybe he knew the people, you know. Uh, but his kids didn't have any feeling about the situation. They just saw uh, this is an opportunity. These guys obviously didn't do any due diligence on this, so it's their fault. It's not our fault. Yeah, so so they just so they got screwed. So remember, so try to remember uh, that rule because uh, you see remember that rule remember that rule both as a tenant and if you're, uh, if you're an owner. Isn't yeah. the landlord breaking the law themselves by not registering the lease agreement? Could, could, could be, could be, but there's a Supreme Court decision specifically stating that that lease agreement is not enforced. You know, I mean, the, 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 if it's not registered on the land title, it's not enforceable beyond that period. So the owner's tax issue, I mean, from a tax standpoint, he's supposed to declare everything irrespective of it, whether it's registered or not. But, uh, that doesn't help the tenant. You know? I mean, the only thing that they could have done is they could have said, they could have said, okay, we understand you don't want to register the lease because you have tax liability, but uh, so, so we'll have a three-year uh, we'll three lease and I'll have an option to renew. I mean, that doesn't eliminate the tenant's uh, risk. But it puts you in a better position that at least you could sue them if he didn't if he didn't allow you to enforce that. Now the bad thing about this is, the extra bad thing, is that what if 
what if the kids would have said, okay, it wasn't registered, so let's register it now. Okay? Yeah. But if you do that, the revenue department will calculate the amount of tax from day one. From day one of the lease. So then nobody will want to do it. You know, if you could if you could approach the new owner and say, okay, only pay the tax from this day forward, then maybe you can you can convince more you can do a deal with them. But if it's the tax from seven years ago, then makes it then that, that mistake hurts for a long time. Okay. Last uh, last story I'll talk about involves a, a Dutch company and the implications of not having a shareholder's dream. Okay, the, the law doesn't require anybody anywhere to have a shareholder's dream. You know, the, the, the law doesn't uh, force people to contract amongst each other. Whether you know when you're uh, when you're forming a company or otherwise. And shareholders' agreement uh, can be quite difficult to uh, negotiate. I mean, there's lots of issues. What happens if this happens? What happens if you know? What happens if one shareholder wants to sell to someone else, but the rest don't? Can they force you know? Can, or, or what happens when one if one shareholder gets offered X uh, per share? Does that mean in order to accept all of them have to get the same deal? It's called the the long lines or not. So you you have to work through a, a lot of things. So that causes a lot of entrepreneurs just not to do it. You know, just, just to avoid it. But that can really uh, cause issues, especially as the circumstances of shareholders change through the life of a business. You know? And so the, this situation involves the two Dutch guys that were in the logistics business and ended up being you know, very, very successful. When the, when the business was uh, originally registered, there were 50-50 partners and there was no shareholders agreement. And then a number of years passed and the, and the business really took off and it had, uh, I think, at the maximum of 130 staff. Then one of the two guys dies. Okay, so, so in, a, in a startup situation like that, uh, you're really owner-operators. You know, there, there's, there's, these guys were passive investors, so, so it left a big void in terms of uh, decisions to be made and areas of expertise when this guy, when this guy dies. So what happens then? You know, when a shareholder dies, just by operation of law, all of his assets, including the shares, go in a pool with what's called his estate. His estate and then a court some, in Thailand or somewhere else will determine who gets what. But the point here is that his business partner has nothing to do with that decision. Absolutely nothing. You know, it could be his mom, it could be his uncle, you know, whoever. Why? Because he didn't plan for that, you know. If, if he would have said, in, in a shareholder agreement, for example, if he was at a, upon the death of a part, uh, uh, one of the parties, the other party has a, an option to buy at a set price. An option to buy at a set price. Now, he's not required to buy, but he has an option to buy. Now, now that's not foolproof, foolproof either, because courts don't like. You know, if I'm the heir, I'm going to say, I don't give a shit what, what. Uh, uh, my dad contracted to because I'm not a party to that agreement, right? I, I'm, a, I'm the heir. But at least the, my intention, if I was the shareholder, my intention would be clear and the method of calculating the shares would be clear. So that that makes the situation much more clear than doing absolutely nothing like, like, like this guy did. How do you set the price when you don't know how the, how the business is going to do? People do it all the time. You can say book value plus, you know, or it can be very simple, or it can be very. You can, you can have you can have appraiser, you know, have a, a third party appraiser stated in the agreement do it, you know, according to certain instructions. So if there was no shareholders. Shares were what? What what their shares were? Well, there's a 
shareholder's list. There's still this. That's it. Because, I mean, like, I'm just thinking of the step number three when the son inherits 50 parents, 50 parents, I would assume there's some procedure where they've got to specify so this person has 50 instead of the original person, and the second person still holds 50. Is there no vehicle or legal vehicle documentation? So what, what happens when someone dies is uh, the court, e either in your will or if you don't have a will, your will will state who your uh, estate manager is or in some place is called an executor. So that, that's important because that's the person, that's the only person that people will talk to. Because in a in a, a, a death situation, the law wants everyone to be very, very careful. You know, so nothing happens. The banks won't talk to anybody until the point where the the, uh, the, the court has appointed the the estate administrator. So when that but when that person is done, his job is to carry out, to carry out the the uh, instructions stated in the will, or if there's not a will, like there was, like, like there wasn't here, to carry out uh, whatever the law says. You know, so here well, there was a determination who gets what, who in the state gets what, and it was determined that his son get 50 percent of the share. So he stepped exactly into his father's. Uh, position into shares 100 through you know 20,000 uh, uh, so he was exactly like like his father and when that happened ideally you would want the, the son to come in and realize that he didn't know anything about the business and, and want the business to go on like his like his dad probably would and sell for uh, Sell for a reasonable price, sell for a reasonable price to, to the other guy, but that wasn't the case here. People's expectations can be you know, crazy in, in this situation, and uh, maybe they only see the lifestyle, but they don't understand the reality of the business or how it was affected by by this debt. And this and the son came in and wanted, uh, being according to the to the other Dutch guy about three times what the shares were worth. But probably in the middle of somewhere. So that wasn't so that wasn't possible. And then after after two years, uh, the the staff completely revolted, you know, revolted against the, this this son and uh, they lost that big turnover and the business went belly up. And so that was a pretty bad pretty bad result as well. And this could have been you now here, uh, the, the other way that people want to address this is that, well, can't you just state, have the, have the two shareholders state in their will exactly what will happen? You, you, you can do that, but you have to understand that's not a contract. You know, if, if I, if, if me and Graham are in business and we both agree in a contract to state who gets what rights to my shares in uh in our will, we have to say the exact same thing. I signed, I signed the agreement. The next day, I changed my will. He can't sue me because that's an illegal contract. Because the, the law doesn't wants to give maximum flexibility to people to change their will whenever they want. So you're so in that situation, your only uh, your your only alternatives are to use a shareholders agreement, or you could use an offshore. You, know, you could use an offshore and have one shareholder here. And, uh, uh, and, and the shares be divided, you know, one, one level up. Isn't, uh, isn't it really a question of control here and not ownership? I mean, wouldn't you be able to handle this by making some uh, directives in the, in the corporate charter about the, who the directors could be or how directors would get chosen? Yes. Isn't the fact that the shares are owned by someone, or is it not you're, you're absolutely right that the control of the, here there are 50-50 partners in terms of equity ownership and control, and that was their problem. When I said that the son, uh, and, and so when the son uh, inherited those shares, his situation was exactly like his dad, okay? So that, so 50% uh, management control. Now, you could have, 
they could easily make a different classes of shares, you know, with different control. But that didn't, but that didn't fit the current, the the uh, original situation because they are really meant to be 50-50 shareholders, you know. And you can't, you can't say upon death we, we take rights away from you as a shareholder. That's not a good story. Mike, um, you you talked about uh, entrepreneurs being unwilling or reluctant to commit spoilers at the start of new projects. Um, I think one of the things, though, is we're really waiting to see that the business is taking off. Yeah. And it's at that stage that you want to commit and start cementing all these bits and pieces up. Would that be a fair no, risk? That's, that's absolutely. It, I'm an entrepreneur, too. You know, and, and people will get you, you know, not just in legal, but other things. They'll say, you know, computer security or, you know, accounting or accounting software. They'll say, oh, you have to do this, but one of the traits of a successful entrepreneur is to really watch your cash flow, and especially in the beginning when it's very dear. But my, my point here is not to say, oh, you should, you should have a legal budget of 25% of your revenue in the first year. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying to recognize as your business becomes more successful, uh, Legal issues are, are things that can trip you up. You know, so, so keep your eyes open. Find a lawyer that maybe, I know Graham likes to take his lawyer to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> get friends. You know, make friends. <laughs> because believe it or not, lawyers can be useful every once in a while. All right? And, uh, and having a relationship with a, with a lawyer will, will, will help, you, you know, help you down the line. All right, so just to... We recap the year. One quick question, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Just want to clarify. Uh, there's there's the shareholders agreement, and then there's the cap table, so to speak. So this this is distinctly about the shareholders agreement. Because right? I'm a little bit mixing this up because I'm thinking, uh, what you're talking about, if I understand correctly, is something that ensures that the two partners in the very beginning, clearly there's a delineation that one of them has 50 percent and the other. Right, and that I normally I think of a cap table. No, no, so, 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 no, 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 no. The fifty percent, fifty percent doesn't have anything to do with the shareholder agreement. I mean, th that just meant that fifty percent of the cash came from one person, fifty percent came from the other person, and they just and if they do that and nothing else, then equity is fifty percent and control is fifty percent. Right. You know, that's it. I mean, and that's a matter of public record, just going to the. That online or administrative online, or something like you don't need a shareholders agreement. Okay, that's a separate point. Now, if you want to go beyond that, if you want to say what happens in this, when you register a company and you do nothing, okay, there's what's called uh, standard articles that the that the uh, lawyer will uh, uh, just file and they'll automatically be approved. Now, those standard articles just absolutely follow what's stated in the criminal in, in the commercial code. And uh, most people don't even don't read it, you know. Uh, and maybe they'll, that that will fit situa situations as they uh, come up in the future, but probably not. The, my, my, my point is that as the business grows, you need to, and you have more to protect, you need to think about what your, what your rights are and what, what should happen, you know, in, in situations if somebody dies or if there's a, if there's a sale opportunity or, or a dispute. crap like that. Like what? A dispute. Or a dispute or deadlock. I mean, 50, 50 uh, man, man, management, uh, management control, you know, it can easily be a deadlock. But, but the, these guys, it wasn't an issue. So would it be correct to say that part of your point is not only having the shareholders agreement to begin with, but also ensuring that the appropriate terms of it are anticipated or planned for situations like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Stay, stay simple, you know, say, stay simple. And I, I'm not saying that if you, if you start a very small uh, business on a shoestring that you need to have a shareholder's agreement. I'm just saying that as the, as the business grows, the need for that, for that uh, framework increases. And these, in this example and in other examples, uh, they didn't plan for that. They were capable.
Okay. So this is just kind of a recap. The, the first guy got, got hit with 35% tax because they're, they got, uh, they're, they sold for $550 million and the registered capital was $10 million. Three years, uh, leases for three years have to be registered on the land title and the shareholders agreement. If you don't have a shareholders agreement, you're, this, the death of a shareholder automatically triggers those shares becoming a part of an estate that you have absolutely no control over. It's one. So, if you have any any questions, uh, just let me know about, about these or anything else. So, in the event of uh, in the event of having uh,
you don't need collateral for financing, you know, things like that, then, then, then it maybe it makes sense to keep keep it low, but uh, you can keep it low, but also plan for your exit in another way. You know, like, like I said, you know, doing the doing offshore, you know, safe offshore thing. But but remember, especially for startups, uh, the amount of your registered capital is public access information. You know, so when no one, when you're dealing with someone who's never, you know, say you have a product and you want to sell to CP, you know, or you know, some, some big player in the market, and they've never heard of you, you know, the first thing that they're going to do is to check, just to go online. It takes, it'll take 30 seconds to check what your registered capital is. If it's 500,000 baht, you probably won't get a call back. So there's, registered capital also has a marketing function, a credit, not marketing, credibility function as well. Uh, I thought it's quite difficult to, to come up with a
you pay the market price irrespective of what price you actually pay. I mean, that, that's what the transfer pricing is. But there's a loophole under the Thai tax code that gives me, as an individual shareholder of a privately held, uh, privately held shares, I can transfer my shares at par value. I can transfer my shares at par value, which is good because that's not a taxable event. That's nothing. So if, if they would have given me six months, and I can find a, I can find a country that has a good double tax treaty with Thailand that says that any uh, the gain of any Thailand asset that occurs in X country is only ta taxable in that country, and it's only taxable at you know three percent. That's, that's completely legal. Completely legal. But you don't want to do that today before. There's nothing. You know, they, everybody puts that on their tax return. There's nothing else. You know. That, that that company that company paid you that uh, 
that the par value for those shares. You know, there's no tax event, but you better have documentation as that that transaction happened. If not, the revenue department's going to say that's just a little shame. Even, even though they know it's a tax planning device, uh, anyway, uh, they'll 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 scrutinize it. They'll really scrutinize it. But, but at the end of the day, it's unlocked. And, Because after this room, he's going to be charging. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Mike.